Hey guys, it's Kyle Bohannon here with another episode of the Art of Physical Fitness show. The Art of Physical Fitness.com is the website here with the guy, the one and only, the glute guy, Brett Contreras of BrettContreras.com and StrengthConditioningResearch.com. Brett, introduce yourself to the folks out there. Hey Kyle, first off, let me thank you for having me on. It's, it's an honor. Um, for those who don't know me, I, um, I kind of wear two hats. I have a, a research review service where we review all, all sorts of um, articles on, in sports science, so strength and conditioning research, uh, biomechanics, anatomy, physiology, motor control, sports medicine, physical therapy, all that stuff. And so I have the sports science hat that I wear, and I try to publish journal articles and be evidence-based. And then the other hat I wear is glutes, and most people know me as the glute guy, and uh, that's kind of my area of expertise. Um, and so my website, I po post a lot of things on glutes. It's probably my main interest. I'm getting my PhD right now, and my thesis uh, is, is um, heavily, um, it's pretty much glute-based. It's looking at the effects of different hip strengthening exercises on performance and things like that. And um, have a, a new book, Strong Curves, coming out in a couple of weeks. And that's a, a book focused on uh, strength training for women and developing. Uh, it's centered around glute training. Um, trying to think what else. Yep, that's about it. So uh, I've got a popular blog at breckandrose.com, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. So I'm pretty much all around the Internet. I'm, I'm everywhere. All right. Well, let's get right into us. First, I want to address the one question that was asked uh, that by one of my fans who wanted to ask you a question about your recent article about the 100 and strength, 120 strength training tips for women. Um, it got some backlash uh, from around the internet coming at you. So just briefly touch on it. She wanted to know, Jen, I uh, wanted to know if you would have taken anything back from it, if you would change anything, if you were to do it again. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So th this is a, a, an article I wrote a few weeks ago. Um, I posted a, a, an article on strength training for women, and uh, and it got it, it's weird because on the one hand it got like three thousand likes and um, it got a lot of reposts and retweets from people that say an awesome article, and then it also got a ton of controversy and um, angry responses. There's like four hundred comments on, on the blog. I quit reading after like one hundred fifty because I. I was like, man, these people are out to get me. They're not out. They're not out to give me the benefit of the doubt. So, the main thing I was kind of disappointed was, like, my whole life, is, my life's work is centered around, you know, like working with women. I train women. I train mostly women, um, you know, and and I even even within the industry, I, I I've got all these friends in the industry. Kelly Davis, Marianne came. Cassandra Forsyth, Joy Victoria, Sohi Lee. Um, I helped form the Girls Gone Strong. I love women, and some of the comments were, you know, like acting like I don't respect women, and I totally do. And the things that, that I wrote about, I get a, I wasn't trying to act like men are superior. I've got a blog ready to go on men, and it's way more degrading. But I laugh at that stuff. I think it's funny, and a lot of people thought it was funny, but a lot of people did not. So the one thing I was disappointed about was that I did not I clearly didn't do a good job of pointing out like that you know this is so, a lot of this is meant to be funny and it's not I get a kick out of the, the clients that do the, the things that some of the things that I mentioned in the, in the article and I know that not every woman does that just like not every man does certain things it's just observations and um, another thing I should have done differently to answer your question there's a couple of things I should have done differently number one um, I named I named I originally named the blog uh, thoughts and observations on training women, and uh, one of my marketing friends, right when I posted the blog, told me, "Brett, you're you're so bad at marketing. Call this 120 strength uh, tips on strength training for women, and you'll get way more shares and and retweets and things like that." In retrospect, I shouldn't have done that. I I maybe it did help me get more reposts and the, the it went viral you know it was on like i don't know got like 35,000 views in a few days which is a lot way more than normal 
It's my most popular blog post I've written. But I don't care about getting, I want good attention, not bad attention. So I shouldn't have done that in retrospect. And the second thing, what I should have done, I've got all these female colleagues in the industry. And if I would have run it past them, like I should have sent this to Jen Sinkler. I should have sent it to Kelly, Marianne, Sohi, Joy, um, um, you know, um, Cassandra Forsyth, all these female friends I have in the industry. They would have probably told me, ooh, Brett, don't post this word it differently or I'd take this out. So to answer the question, yes, I would have done stuff differently um, in retrospect. But to defend myself, some of the comments, like I get all I got I read all these comments and you know I've got a bunch of male strength coach friends and even female strength coach fans and they they wrote me and said you know, they read the comments and they're like, Brett, these people don't train women. They don't you know if they did they they'd recognize some of this stuff. And Kyle, you'd know, you, you yeah. train, I mean, you'd see some of this stuff, but if you don't train women, you don't see it. You don't know what happens. So a lot of the comments, I just look right over. I go, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. So anyway, I would have done stuff differently, lesson learned. And uh, luckily my, my core group of people still love me. So there you go for that. <laughs> well, let's get into the um, training. One thing before we get into more of the, sports science side of things. Uh, one of the topics that's going around on the social media, Facebook and stuff a lot lately, um, is the fact, is its belief in overtraining. If it's, is it a fact or a fiction? Does it exist? What is your opinion on overtraining? Good question. Um, okay, overtraining, I've, I've got a folder. I've, I've got all these research folders and I have like 50, maybe even more. I have so many journal articles on the topic. Most of them look at, you know, endurance athletes. And athletes, and it's there isn't much research with, you know, like just male lifters, just everyday male lifters. Now, for those people who say, like, even like John, I wrote an article with John Bros. I think it's my most popular article on Teen Nation. Yeah, I read called, that. Yeah, it's good. Max squats every day, and I quoted him. John Bros is very smart. He's also very strong. He's a big man, and uh, he's very like you know. He says things very matter-of-factly. I love the guy. I went out and visited him. But even he, if you pressed him, you know, because he says there's no such thing as overtraining and he gives good rationale. He says if you, a workout kicks your butt, it's because you're out of shape. You're not in shape to handle that. And I, what I wish more, got, what more people could do was like, like when I read that stuff, I gain a lot out of it. I don't take it as... Like I learn from articles that I read. I don't read them to point, you know, to like pick out flaws. Because if you really scrutinize even John Bro's system, he doesn't have a max out on deadlifts every day. It's different. You can squat. I'm sure you know this, Cal, because you train high frequency. You can squat yeah. more often. You can squat with higher intensity frequently. It doesn't. Um, well, I don't think you can powerlifting style squat. You know, like five days a week. But you can Olympic squat. You 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 know if you have a, a little bit narrower stance and you distribute the load between your hips and your knees, um, you, you how could you refute that? Olympic lifters do it; they all do it. So you, and you could say they're the genetic elite, but even everyday lifters are doing it. John Bros doesn't have people max out on the deadlift very infrequently, but they do do power cleans and snatches and things like that or uh, power snatches, snatches, power cleans, and cleans all the time. Those are, I know the kinematics are different than a deadlift, but you could say it's kind of a submaximal deadlift with acceleration, you know? So there's a lot to take home from that. You can squat heavy very frequently, but it's to a training max, not a competition max. You're not going in there trying to set a PR every day. You're, having a, you're working yourself up to what you can do for that day. Some days are good days, some days are bad days, some days are in between, but it's that hammering it hard every day. But you do have a limit. Obviously, you wouldn't train seven days a week. You wouldn't like set an alarm in the middle of the night and go train. You know what I mean? You yeah. need your sleep. Um, there is such thing as overtraining. If you don't believe me, just deadlift to a max 20 days in a row and watch yourself get weaker and weaker. And um, But overtraining is a very specific like a lot of people confuse the terms overreaching or overtraining. Overtraining takes you like, you know, can take six months to years to, to get over. It's a physiological, um, you know, 
condition where you you screwed yourself. It takes you a long time to get out of it. Overreaching, so it's kind of in the literature you see a lot of researchers explain that most people confuse overreaching with overtraining, and there's planned overreaching. So um, I know there is some research with Olympic lifters that looked at, you know, like testosterone and cortisol and stuff, and it, you know, on on unloading weeks, for example, your your testosterone will go up and cortisol will go down a little. And when you're pushing it really hard, your testosterone will be going down when you're really pushing it, you know, the pedal to the metal and cortisol will go up a little bit, but you're still setting records, you're setting PRs. So, you know, you can look, there's lots of things you can look at, heart rate variability, um, testosterone and cortisol ratios, there's all these indicators, you know, um, grip strength and things like that, all these indicators, but a good program both, you know, deals with it, it periodizes the program, but you also have auto auto regulation in there, training by instinct, you know. And what I love about John Bros, he says, "What you feel is a lie." And if if you train frequently, you will know that to be true. Some days you do not have it, like you're not feeling it, and you're like, "Oh my god, this is gonna be a crappy workout day," and you somehow set a PR. And some days you feel great, and you're like, "Man, I think today I'm gonna." I'm going to pull like some, you know, or squat some heavy load and you don't and you're like, oh, I feel great. I don't get it. So what you feel is a lie, but some people take that too far. Like if you're like shoulder is jacked up or your knees jacked up, you don't go, oh, what I'm feeling is a complete lie. I need to push through pain or you don't like go, God, you know, I'm used to deadlifting 600 pounds, but 450 feels really heavy right now. Oh, I'm going to push it anyway. You have to listen to your body and all the best lifters do it. So is there such thing as overtraining? You're damn right there is. We all have to monitor our training and make adjustments and we you don't train. I mean, if there were no such thing as overtraining, you would train 24 hours a day and you would try to like get no sleep and just slam caffeine and just train and train and train. And the more you train, the more results you'd see. It's just like the human body is like a plant. You've got, but the, but it's more complicated. If only it were that simple. With a plant, you've got like just a few variables. You've got soil quality. You've got, you know, water, and you've got sunlight. But with humans, there's a lot more variables. You've got all these genetic factors in play. You've got structural factors like your anthropometry, and you've got injury histories, and you've got volume and frequency and intensity and um, intensity of load and intensity of effort, you've got density, you've got all exercise selection, exercise order, all these acute training variables, and then you've got your sleep, your nutrition, your supplementation, your recovery, your stress, your lifestyle factors, and you've got all these different variables. So that's what makes it very hard to be scientific with program design because you've got the scientific method, which is try to control the vari variables, but how many times you set a PR and you're like, what was that? Was that this new? Was that because I'm doing this new assistance exercise? Or was this because I've been sleeping well? Or I changed my, I, we changed so many things, it's hard to really pinpoint things. So that's what makes, you know, strength and conditioning so interesting. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's go into the, let's go into the uh, hips and the glutes actually in particular. I want to talk on the subject of hip extension and hip hyperextension, the difference between the two, and also how knee flexion, because I've been reading your book, Hip Extension Torque, how knee flexion, a degree of it, plays into it and how that can go into your training for planning uh, training. Okay. Um, so I've kind of backed off of the hip hyperextension language. Um, with the spine, you don't, you want to keep the spine mostly neutral you don't want to hyperextend the spine when you're doing a deadlift or a hip thrust or a back extension, stuff like that. But you can hyperextend the hips. When you walk, for example, you hyperextend the hips. But it's kind of confusing because the pelvis also tilts. So sometimes people are anteriorly tilting and they're not really getting hip hyperextension. Really what you just want is end range hip, hip extension. I started talking about this because some, some exercises don't load up end range hip extension. For example, when you do a squat, the hardest part of a squat is at the bottom. That's when you get the highest hip extension torque in a squat. But as you rise up, it's easy. And you don't keep pushing the glutes forward in a squat to where you're in hip hyperextension. You just stand up straight. You wouldn't like 
push the glutes forward. In the deadlift, you do hyperextend a little bit. You want to squeeze those glutes forward to make sure you lock out, but that isn't the hardest. That's actually the easiest portion of the lift. The hardest part is the lift is, is you know, lifting it off the floor now, and it gets easier as you come up. With that in mind, um, kind of a sidebar, do, would it make a difference then if you're using like accommodating these resistance bands or chains where it starts getting heavier at the top? Sure, but even so, you can even use, because I see some coaches go, well, a power clean, you're accelerating it through that hip extension, hip hyperextension range of motion, so you are loading that up, and you can use accommodating resistance in squats and deadlifts. You still, uh, you still get more, like, there's more hip extension torque in a heavy hip thrust or back extension at the top, because that's where you get into the directional, the force vectors. If the force is pushing your hips this way, right at end range, you're getting all that force is pushing the hips, is going against the hips. But when the force is coming downwards, only a component of that um, is really pushing it straight against the hips, is acting on the hips in that direction. So if you calculate the instantaneous hip extension torque of these different exercises, you'll find that each one has is loaded in different, you know, it, it gets its peak um, peak torque accentuation in a particular position. And so if you graph them on a, on a graph, you can have a, a torque angle curve. And it's kind of cool to see the squat, you know, the squat, if you're at the bottom of the squat, it starts out really high and then it gets lower over time. So here's the bottom of a squat up high and then here's the end of the squat down low. But think of a back extension. A back extension when you're at the very bottom, like a horizontal back extension, it's very it's unloaded. You could just hang out there and rest forever. When you get to the top, it's the hardest. So it has a different curve on the hips. So it's like when you start analyzing these exercises, you realize squats are great for strengthening your hips down low. So are deadlifts. Uh, back extensions and hip thrusts are good for strengthening the glutes at end range. Some, like the 45 degree hyper is really good at strengthening the glutes in the middle range. And so you start realizing that probably if you want optimum hip strength, you probably should do multiple exercises. And, and if you think about it, the sport of powerlifting does not re need much end range hip extension strength. The hardest part of a squat and a deadlift are at the bottom and it gets a little bit easier at the top. And so is that, so does that, does that therefore mean that, that has a couple of implications? Number one, do hip thrusts and back extensions really help powerlifting that much? You, anecdotally, some people swear by it. And you look at West Side, they're doing a lot of exercise that focus on end range hip extension. They do reverse hypers, which get kind of an even, even torque throughout. They're doing pull throughs. They're doing back extensions. They're doing 45 degree back extensions. And um, all these in sled, sled work and stuff. And a lot of this focuses on more end range hip extension, but their primary lifts, their main lifts are squats, deadlifts, and good mornings. Each of those have the hardest part in the flex position, down low, and then an end range hip extension, it's, you know, they choose the assistance exercise to help out. Maybe those help through building hypertrophy so you can create more force, you know, through more cross-sectional area and better leverage of the muscle itself, but greater mu muscle moment arm. But, um, but some people do swear by it, and I think if you just have poor glute activation, these end range hip extension exercises lead to much higher glute activations, way higher. So I think it can also help by just activating the glutes. But let's move away from powerlifting and focus on sports. Most of sports are upright. You're not down in this crouched position all the time. You're up on the, you know, on the ground surface, more upright, looking to change directions and things. So you need more neutral-ish hip extent, not just hip extension, but, you know, hip rotation, hip abduction, hip extension, um, torque production or, or, or power production. And so that's why I think in the weight room, you want to, you're always going to do squats and Olympic lifts and things like that, but you can supplement with these assistance exercises to build stronger hips, which they can then transfer on the field because you're strengthening these ranges of motion that are more common to these ranges seen on the field. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Phenomenal. But, but to answer your question, hip hyperextension, you don't have to really think, am I hyperextending the hips? Just go to your end range. Some people have more hip extension range of motion. You just want to, like when you're doing a hip thrust, I see some people going too heavy and coming up three-fourths of the way. 
but you're you're robbing yourself of maximum glute activation because the glutes activate harder as you reach end range. So you want to go all the way up to the top and really squeeze those glutes and then come down. And that way you 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 build full range hip strength or full spectrum hip strength. So and then as knee flexion, sorry, you asked another question yeah. with knee flexion. When the knee is bent, uh, the hamstrings are they're slack, they're shortened. You cannot produce as much force in the hamstrings. So the muscle force in the hamstrings goes down due to poor length tension relationships. And so that torque production has to come from somewhere else. The hamstrings still do help out, just not quite as much. So the glutes pick up the slack. The glutes end up doing a little bit more. And then that's why things like the bottom of a squat, the hamstrings can't help out as much as they could if they were straightened more. That's why deadlifts, the hammies are more important in a deadlift than they are in a squat. And then, um, and then the hip thrust, you will feel the hamstrings when you go heavy, but the glutes do more of the work because the hamstrings are in a suboptimal length tension relationship. So it's called active insufficiency. The hamstrings can't do their thing because they're shortened at the knees, so they're in active insufficiency. And then the higher you go up in a hip thrust because the knees stay bent, so you've got these bent knees, and so here's the hip thrust. The knees are bent, and then as you come up to the top, the hips are extending, so the hamstrings are being shortened more and more as the hips extend, and then the glutes end up doing more work because they're a monoarticular joint, whereas the hamstrings are a biarticular joint, so they're doing less and less as you rise up and the glutes are doing more. So with the glute ham uh, bench or glute ham raise, with that, it's the same principle there. As you're getting higher, the hamstring is getting shorter, um, so the glutes are contributing more at the top of no, the... I actually wrote an entire article on T-Nation about the glute ham raise. It was called Gutting the Glute Ham Raise, and my whole premise was the glute ham raise is an amazing hamstring exercise, but if you calculate the hip extension torque of a glute ham raise, it's not much at all. If you calculate the knee flexion torque, it's amazing. And if you have electrodes hooked up to the glutes during a glute ham raise, not impressive. If you have them hooked up to the hamstrings, it's through the roof. You can get above 100% activation of the fibers. Um, it's Think about what you're doing in a glute. Is, think of a Russian leg curl. Mm -hmm. A glute ham raise is different. I've owned a glute ham raise for like, I don't know, 10 years now, and I love it. But it is, if you do it, it works on the hammies. The glutes don't have to do much. What are the glutes doing? Keeping the torso upright. I mean, is that really that challenging just for the glutes to keep the torso upright? The, the, the motion in a glute ham raise, the hips stay neutral the whole time. The, the range of motion is at the knee joint. So the knees are flexing, flexing while the glutes erect the torso. I mean, the glutes can erect the, I mean, think of a deadlift. They can erect the torso and hundreds of pounds. So, um, anyway, so you, the, the, do glute ham raises, do Russian leg curls but know that they're working on the hamstring. It should not be called glute ham raise. It should be called a hamstring raise or something like that, but uh, it does not require that much out of the glutes. Okay. In fact, when I do a body weight glute ham raise, just body weight, my glutes fire at 10% of MVC, and that's in some of the other people I've tested. It's not that impressive. The hamstrings, that's a different story. It's an amazing hamstring exercise, and I think it's important in sports to strengthen the hamstrings through both hip extension and knee flexion because uh, surrounding like the foot strike the hamstring has to be strong in hip extension and also in knee flexion to help rotate the body over the over the foot so um, basically a variety of exercises I can justify every exercise but a good coach has to say okay there's all these great exercises what are my big rocks what am I throwing into a program and as long as you have a sound justification and you're not doing too much, then you know I'm, I can support a lot of different types of programs. All right. Well, going off of that, what what you throw in your program, what's justified? What's the difference for you, or when do you put into a program the difference between a single leg hip extension exercise or a bilateral hip extension exercise? It's like a single leg hip thrust or a bilateral hip thrust. Um, okay. Uh, well, I would actually like to talk about the whole single and versus bilateral debate. Um, when you train athletes, um, sometimes you'll get the person who's like a really good squatter or a good deadlifter, and then you have them try a single leg movement like a Bulgarian split squat, and they're terrible at it, and it's so hard for them. Now, some of that's just balance and coordination issues, so they get strong real quick, but sometimes it's just they have poor hip stability, and that's important to have good hip stability, so you want to bring them up, but how long does it take to bring them up? So. You've got the one argument that some strength coaches, especially like Mike Boyle, he will say, when you take your eyes off, like, like 
inevitably strong squatters, you know, they're eventually going to get so strong and then further improvements, they're going to be um, encouraged to bend over and use poor form, turning into like a squat morning and their form is going to go to crap and you're just fighting an uphill battle with them because you want to, you don't want to just use the same weight every year, year after year. You want to get stronger over time. And so why give them the squat? Because they're just going to use poor form and end up possibly hurting themselves. A safer exercise is the heavy Bulgarian split squat. He calls it the rear foot elevated split squat because they stay more upright. They don't cheat as bad. I do agree that the rear foot elevated is safer. I've heard some strength coaches go, oh, that can be hard on the sacrum and that can do this, that can do that. Well, that's all speculation. You have to actually have had a lot of experience with an exercise before you speculate about it. That's one problem I have. I can tell so many coaches, they'll say things and I go, yeah, you can make that theory, but in the real world, that doesn't happen. Just like people who say the hip thrust is dangerous. I'm going, if you get good at programming it, you know that they're safe. Same with the bullet. Same with rear foot elevated split squat. They're very safe when you tri when you pr when you teach proper form. So I do agree with that. It's safer, but I also say when you're a strength coach and you've got you know limited coaching staff and you've got lots of athletes, then maybe you could make that case. But I'm a per a personal trainer, so when you're a personal trainer, the set stops when the weights get heavy. It's like okay, or not when the weights get heavy, when form starts to break down. So like if I'm watching my clients squat and they start to lean forward, it doesn't just happen where like rep one is perfect, rep two is perfect, rep three, oh, they totally, it's like there's a, there's a form degradation, you know, like this. It's like, you know, as the set goes on, it begins to erode. Well, you just don't let them take it this far. You stop it right here or something, you know, and you say, you know, one more rep or, or, or okay, that's good. Stop there or something. You have them rack it and you build up that discipline and you can be right there to monitor. So I am all in favor of bilateral exercises. I like unilateral as well. Variety is always a good thing, but I think with like sprint athletes, for example, and high level af athletes, kind of my take is kind of like this. And I, Charlie Francis kind of thought this way you're doing a lot of unilateral stuff in sport training. When you sprint, when you do agility stuff, when you drag sleds, when you do a lot of plyometrics are unilateral. And so you're doing a lot of unilateral stuff in your speed and agility and power, you know, in plyometric training. So in the weight room, you can do a little bit more bilateral stuff. I kind of like that because with bilateral, you you know, you're, you're using heavier loads. You're putting more loading on the erectors for core stability purposes. Now, that you could also use that same argument to say why you shouldn't do it. You're loading the spine more. I want to load the hips more rather than the spine. So I could just, if you said to me, Brett, I want you to argue in favor of Bilateral over unilateral, I could do a good job. And if you said, I want you to switch roles and argue, argue unilateral over bilateral, I could do a good job too. I could justify either way. And I think at this point, uh, we have enough. There's a journal article showing that no, no differences, no significant differences between unilateral and bilateral it, uh, when pitted against each other. In fact, there was a little bit of edge that the unilateral had because they were better with unilateral plyos, I think. And there's anecdotal, there's a must, uh, enough lifters who have done unilateral and bilateral and seen, you don't see any drop off in your vertical lead from taking out squatting as long as you're doing a, a heavy knee dominant exercise. So I think no coach should be able to say bash one or the other for choosing one or one over the other if they have, uh, if they understand the, the science behind it, they understand the dilemma and they make a choice based on a rational decision. Now let me get into some specifics with the actual exercises. So if you do like a squat or a, any knee dominant lift, that's co compound knee dominant lift. So you could do a squat, a front squat, a zercher squat, you know, deep squat, half squat, whatever, any squat variation. Or you could do like a Bulgarian split squat, a step up, a high step up, um, a reverse lunge, a walking lunge, anything like that. If you have electrodes on, the glutes, the hamstrings, the qu the quads, you get very similar activation with all these different movements. You know, you can argue, well, the front squat is more quad and the back squat is more glute. and th th There's not much difference when you actually test people in EMG. So they're all pretty similar in EMG when they're like squatting movements. Now with deadlifts, deadlifts versus, say, single leg RDLs, similar EMG. So when their loading comes from above, like vertical loading or axial loading, so it's a squatting and deadlifting patterns, 
there's not much difference between single and double A. And not much difference with back extensions and, and single leg reverse hypers. I like single leg reverse hypers because you, you don't have that, you can control the, the lumbar spine better. But you don't get that much difference in activation. But for some reason, the hip thrust on the people I have tested with the hip thrust, you get much higher activation when you do bilateral compared to single leg. And here's my rationale. If I say stand up and squeeze your glutes as hard as you can, you will notice that when you squeeze your glutes, your, your, femurs, your, le your, your femurs turn out a little. That's right. hip external rotation. So at the top of a hip thrust, when you squeeze your glutes to lock out the weight, you, your, you know, your, your glutes will naturally externally rotate at end range hip extension. So if you're doing two bilateral, two legs at a time, you have maximum stability, and it doesn't matter if both sides are externally rotating the hip, it doesn't matter because you stay aligned. But when you try one leg at a time and you go to the top, it's like it's trying to rotate, the, the external rotation component is kind of twisting you a little bit, and I think it decreases stability, and when you have less stability, on the one hand, you could say muscles work harder to stabilize, but they also work as prime movers, and they will shut down as prime movers to produce more force because you're not stable. So I found with hip thrust, they work better when you're stable in a bilateral pattern. However, I'm very open to, the, to find that over time, this has very much to do with anthropometry, for example, body segments length, because the people I've tested will say, I don't feel as much glute activation when I do single leg versus double leg, but I do have colleagues that say they totally feel the single leg, and they can load up the single leg. When I do a heavy single leg, like a barbell, you know, I have 95 pounds is hard for me to stay balanced with a barbell single leg hip thrust. But my friend Ben Bruno, for example, he's super strong at single leg hip thrust, and he feels his glute working even more with the single leg pattern. So if you're like if you're like that, where you feel the single leg working just as much glute as the double leg, uh, it might be better to choose that because you know single leg has other benefits. It builds coordination and stability and you're using less loading so it can be better on the spine and it doesn't, I don't think the hip thrust is that bad it's, except if you start getting into the five, six hundred pound range you can start feeling some just overall compression but that's why you really want to you know, understand good pelvic, lumbo-pelvic mechanics, lumbo-pelvic hip complex mechanics with these different exercises because um, they're different, which I could, if you want, I could go into that. That's a different question, though. You want me to? By all means, yeah. Okay. So this is actually an interesting topic because uh, Virko Shansky and um, Mel Sif actually said this. P Pavel Satsalin pointed this out to me. He said, uh, he sh I, I read Super Training a couple times, but I skipped over this quote. And I went back and found it. And he's right. It's in there. I found the quote. I even looked up the journal article they referenced. And I don't think they should have referenced this. It's, it didn't get really enough support, in my opinion. But they basically said, at the bottom of a squat or a deadlift, when picking loads up from the floor in a squat lift or a deadlift or something like that, the correct pelvic position is anterior pelvic tilt. But when carrying loads at waist high or doing sit-ups, the correct pelvic position is posterior tilt. So I started thinking about this. And I started thinking... You know, Stu McGill did some research with the kettlebell swing. He's found that the, one of the most the da most dangerous part of a swing is when the bell is flying upwards. You know, out in front of you, and you're if you're relaxed, if your spinal muscles are relaxed, the bell is pulling you forward, and you've got these high shearing forces. Well, what helps protect against shear is compressive forces. Think of um, the the core muscles clamping down and keeping the spine stable and then you try to move it forward or backward it's going to be more stable so think of what how that applies to how the the RKC and like Pavel teach swings is to keep those glutes turned on well you keep those glutes turned on you watch the best kettlebell swingers they're in some posterior pelvic tilted end range you watch the best hip thrusters and they don't necessarily go into pelvic tilt, but they aren't hyper over, you know, overarching their low lumbar spine, their low back. They aren't hyperextending their low back. They keep, they move at the hips and not the low back. So to summarize all this, I do agree at the bottom of a squat or a deadlift, you want to be pulled into flexion. You have to be thinking anterior pelvic tilt. Whether you really are anterior tilting or not, you're thinking anterior tilt. You're thinking, hold that extension of the spine 
Don't go into overextension or hyperextension, but hold that extension because when I pull this weight off the floor or when I start to ascend out of a squat, I want to flex, but I am keeping the muscles turned on that create extension and anterior tilt. As you rise up though, now if you keep turning those muscles on, you're going to overarch. At the top of a hip thrust or a back extension or at the end of a deadlift, you want to hyperextend. Your body will kind of want to do that. and You have to build the discipline to squeeze the glutes forward. And you don't, so I think a little bit of posterior tilt is a good thing to build that glutes are finishing off hip extension. Now, Stu McGill would tell you the safest spinal position is always neutral. And he would also say that pe the pelvis influences the lumbar spine. So when you are in, when you're forcing anterior pelvic tilt, it will cause the lumbar spine to extend, to hyperextend. When you're forcing posterior pelvic tilt, the lumbar sp spine will flex a little bit. But there is some wiggle room. You can actually do some stuff to the pelvis. You can move the pelvis slightly without influencing the lumbar spine that much. So it's just a little bit. This is what Mel Siff and Verkoshansky said. It's just a little bit of posterior tilt or a little bit of anterior tilt, not much. And it's just those, when those muscles are turned on. So here's how I think about it. You've got a door and you want to, this door is unstable. You can push this way or this way. Well, at the bottom of the squat, you want to bust your sit from this side. You want to push against because it's going to want to swing open this way and you're pushing up against it. The pelvis is that guy pushing up against the wall for you. So you want the pelvis anteriorly tilting at the bottom of a squat to keep that, to buttress against that. But then at the top of a hip thrust or even a deadlift or a kettlebell swing, you want the posterior pelvic tilt pushing up against the door this way. It's just buttressing just to ensure that your lumbar spine doesn't move too much. So it's ironic there that the pelvis can cause too much motion in the lumbar spine, but the muscles need to be turned on to prevent motion and build that discipline. So um, I th think Stu would probably agree with what I just said. But if you said you're going into a lot of anterior tilt or a lot of posterior tilt, he'd disagree. Uh, but it's definitely something I, I plan on studying down the road. It's an interesting topic. Okay. Let's shift the focus now uh, to load vector training. You're talking about it. You mentioned it a couple times so far in this interview. Uh, but just go ahead and give us a brief introduction for those who don't know what load vector training uh, is and then get into it a little deeper. So uh, load vector training is something I came up out with in my glute ebook a few years back. And I basically said, when you look at sports, you're in all these different directions. You, you think of you're an athlete, you're on the field, you're a, a football player or something, you're on the field. You might need to sprint forward. You might need to be in a lean, you know, and like in a crouch position at a 45 degree angle. You might need to push up against someone, you know, and blast through them. You might be more upright pushing through them. You might need to cut to the left. You might need to cut to the right. You might need to uh, twist. You might need to throw somebody. You might need to swing or throw something and create twisting torque. You might need to backpedal. You might need to jump into the air. You might need to land. There's all these different directions. Essentially, there's eight different directions if you think about it. Up, down, left, right, forward, backward, twist, right, twist, left. So those are the eight directions and each each action can be trained on the field, sprinting, backpedaling, agility stuff, plyometric stuff, you know, different ranges of sprints. But in the weight room, we can also train these different ranges of motion because in those motions, different actions and different ranges of joint motion are stressed. And so in the weight room, we got to look at that. Should you just do squats or should you add in hip thrusts? Should you just do... Uh, do squats suffice for agility work or should you add in the slide board? Um, you know, can uh, some s special sled work or medicine ball exercises help bridge the gap between strength and the field? Um, like rotational med ball work. Um, you know, we need to start thinking about these directions of forces and then tr making sure we're training them in a weight room. Okay. Um, let's go into... Uh an article I believe you read on your website, it might have been part of your blog, uh, about your, it was a discussion about Olympic lifting versus kettlebells uh, for t power development, about which um, is more beneficial, I believe, you were going into. Uh, do you remember that post? Could you elaborate on it? Yeah, I do. The, that study, it was just a poor, poorly designed study. They had people, heavy Olympic lifting versus light kettlebell training. Come on. They, they make heavier kettlebells. So let's, 
you know, I think that when we, future research is going to show you get more hip power out of the kettlebell swing than you do in these Olympic lifts, but um, hip power, power is force times velocity. Well, if you're looking at joint power, it's, it's torque times angular velocity. And so you would have to use like inverse dynamics in, which involves a force plate and, you know, motion capture like cameras all around with, with markers on your body. And then you can have EMG fine tuned into, into it, but it's very complicated, but you'd have to use that sort of system and then determine, okay, which exercises are producing more hip, more hip power. And I think you'll find that like not, maybe it's a mid range of kettlebell swings, but maybe, you know, for me, I can do kettlebell swings with, with like, um, I can do like, uh, 203 pounds. And now it, that's even easy for me now, the 203-pound kettlebell swings because I've had this 203-pound kettlebell. Well, if you can deadlift, you know, 585 and the 203-pound kettlebell, it's still kind of hard to swing, but you get good at it. People can get good at heavier swings. So what's the, max, what's the load that produces op maximum power? It's different for every exercise. The load that produces maximum power in a vertical jump is body weight. You... But with a power clean, it's like 85% of one rep max. So, you know, there's different exercises involved, different loads that maximize power production. Now, why is that important? There is actually a lot of research, surprisingly, that shows that when you train at the load that maximizes power production, that it transfers best to power. So it's important. We need to know what is the load that optimizes power for a, a kettlebell swing, and it's probably, you, you need to use it as a percentage of body weight. So maybe it's, you know, 15% of body weight, maybe it's 30% of body weight, I don't know, but we need to do this research, and it could be different for different skill, skill levels. Um, what is better for sport performance? Here's where it depends. If you just said Olympic lifts versus kettlebell swings, I would probably say Olympic lifts, but what if you did squats and kettlebell swings versus squats and Olympic lifts. It's the combination that really matters because no coach just does one exercise. So that's what I'm interested in learning over time. What combinations of things produce the best results? Um, building off of that though, what is your make of say increasing the speed of uh, the movement? Say is dive bomber or band assisted swings where the band or a partner is throwing it down in between your legs to increase velocity um, as opposed to just going heavier in a swing? You know, um, I've seen a lot of, like, Joe, I've seen Joe DeFranco and Smitty use that, uh, um, the band resisted and the accentuated, the partner assisted. I haven't done those. I don't, I usually do my swings out of my own condo and I don't have anyone there with me. I would love, if I was a strength coach training a lot of athletes, I'd love to experiment with that and learn more about that. I think, I, I see the bands, I see people doing them, and I'm like, that looks really cool. It doesn't look like it screws up kinematics. It le looks like good form. It over, you know, it accentuates the eccentric component. Um, but I also, on, on the one hand, I just say, you know, those people need to buck up and buy heavier kettlebells. Because <laughs> I don't want, I don't need the bands with the 203 pounder. But then I could say that about squats and deadlifts. So yeah. I do, there is actually a lot of research supporting accommodating resistance in the literature. Most studies, when they show we did, you know, bench press with just straight weight or with chains, you know, or you know, squats with chains or bands or something versus squat without them, the, the usually better results are seen with the accommodating resistance. So. I think it's something that we underutilize because it's kind of, uh, first of all, it's a pain in the butt to set up and it's also hard to like progressive overload. You just think straight weight, you know, progressive overload. Okay, I want to get stronger. At the, how much bar weight do I use? How much band weight? How much chain weight? It gets complicated. So I, that is definitely something worth pursuing and worth figuring out. I just don't know enough about it to answer your question. Now this is uh, the next question. It ties in both your two previous topics: the so swings and the load vector training. I believe you had posted something about this through your strength conditioning research on on Facebook. Uh, but the difference between the force production of a, a kettlebell snatch and a kettlebell swing is there a difference there? I believe you were mentioning it's more snatch is more projecting upwards and swing is more projecting horizontally. Is that correct? Um, I know Stu McGill did a study looking at activation. And like lumbar loads, he didn't look at force production, I don't believe. 
Um, and there was a study by Lake, um, really good study by a researcher named Lake out of the UK. They looked at the mechanics of swings, but they didn't. I, I think they did look at snatches, but I can't. I can't remember. I would say you get more ground reaction force with the kettlebells than the swings. I mean, sorry, with the swings than the snatches. Um, and I think you'd get more hip. It's just a very coordinated exercise. There's some exercise that you just like the hip thrust. People like the hip thrust so much because you can load the hell out of your hips. Mm -hmm. You know, you do it right. You're yeah. like, I think there's a way to get more tension on the hips. And that's the kettlebell swing. When you're coordinating, you have good lumbo, you know, pelvic hip complex rhythm or whatever you want to call it. When you've got good, you know, hip hinging ability. It just feels really coordinated. It feels more coordinated to most people than a swing or a snatch. But when you do a kettlebell snatch, it's kind of more coordinated because it's in it's in the middle. But something about having to go overhead. Same with the, you know, like the snatch the snatch in general. You are using lighter loads because you're moving it through. You got to accelerate it to reach a greater height. So you're trading some force for velocity, so you probably do get high power outputs, but you're working more on the velocity spectrum of the power e equation rather than the force side. So it's good to use a variety of – combined training is always shown to be superior in the literature. So co a combined approach is always good. So you can do the – like it, it all depends. You can do the he a heavier lift and then a kettlebell snatch, or you know you can do – you know, a variety of things work. It's so hard to the answer to everything is always it depends. So, <laughs> um, let's uh, sh let's end this uh, interview, kind of shifting the conversation to you. I know you mentioned uh, one of the pre um, conversations before we started the interview, but you got a powerlifting meet coming up. Um, and in one of the articles, you mentioned also the special workouts you were doing that got you to a fi your 585 deadlift on your goal to get into 600. Um, what were the special workouts? Are you still utilizing them? And how can someone else implement something similar? Um, yeah, when I got to my 585, I really took my grip training seriously, um, and that, that helped a lot. Um, I've tried everything. I'm so focused on my deadlift. I have found that the more I focus on my squat, then my deadlift goes down. It's easier to focus, it's easier to, and it's funny because most lifters would say the squat is a good assistance exercise for the deadlift, but when you're trying to build everything, it's harder when you're when you just say I am trying to build my deadlift, and you start doing the deadlift alone in a workout or first in a workout. You start gearing your assistance exercises for the deadlift. And you start really paying the most attention to the deadlift instead of deadlifting after you're squatting with lighter loads and submaximal deadlifts. You can really take your deadlift to a new level. I think it's good for a power lifter to say I'm going to focus on my squat here, my deadlift, rather than always trying to bring everything up equally. Um, with my deadlift, I found that my, I started doing a lot of heavy kettlebell swings, and that strength that with a 203 pound kettlebell, they, it has a the only one that I've made it I've seen is a, a company called Ader, and it's a very thick handle still. So you've got a double overhand that that builds good grip strength. But I found that it was fixing my deadlift form, meaning I round a lot, and it got me stronger in an arched position. I was really happy. The first time I deadlifted 500 pounds with pretty good form without excessive rounding, which that's a whole other topic with form with deadlifts. But um, I, I, can't, I can't build my deadlift without rounding my upper back, and that's something Konstantin Konstantinov noticed. He, if he tried to stay super arched, he never got his – he couldn't build his strength like he could with the round back method. Now, when you do have an upper back round, um, it is harder. Uh, it, it is easier to get off the floor, but it's harder to lock out. When you deadlift with a strict arch, it's it's harder to initiate off the floor, but then the lockout is easy. So that kind of changes the assistance lifts that you should be doing based on that. But um, I still do special uh, special workouts for deadlifts and things like that. I always try and throw in some extra posterior chain and grip work. Um, but the deadlift is a tricky animal. It's so it has a mind of its own. Sometimes you're doing everything right and your deadlift freezes, it stalls, even goes backwards. Sometimes you're doing everything wrong and out of nowhere you pull a heavy weight. It's a it's a stubborn, tricky animal. It's got its own rules. Now you mentioned because how how you're talking about the deadlifting with more of a rounded upper back. Um, I think it's very similar to me. I mean, I pull. 
I mean, I do a lot of deficit deadlifts, so it's kind of, so I have strength off the ground pretty well. Um, so, but so for a person like me, because I do start to get to that grind from my knees up, what is something I need to utilize? Would it be hip thrust at that point, or what would you say? I think the best thing you can do is for like ultra specificity is pauses at those difficult positions. Lighten up the load, go to 80%, and you know, do a get some reps in there where you pause at the really hard position and then um, the, and, and that's probably the best thing you can do because it's the most specific and then other things you can do to build your lockout would be hip thrusts and back extensions and things like that however you could also make the opposite argument and say I'm gonna build my I'm gonna actually do more arched back stuff to get more strength off the floor so I don't have to, to I can build more strength and power and hold better position off the floor because that that makes the, the lockout easier in and of itself just by holding better position off the floor so uh, one of these days I need to make a deadlift product or a powerlifting product because uh, the biomechanics fascinate me and I've thought about the biomechanics of the different of the, the power lifts themselves and the assistance lifts and how it all ties together and it's a very intricate relationship between everything in a fascinating topic now you you're going to be competing your first powerlifting meet uh coming up when is it april 7th so like a couple weeks now so how have, how have you been pre preparing for it and what are you shooting for i have been doing full body uh full body workouts but each day has a different emphasis like one day i'm my i do the lifts but one day i'm mostly interested in my squat one day my deadlift one day my bench and actually this Federation 100% Raw has a curl contest too, which I'm going to do. So I've been doing curls as well, strict curls. Um, but my what I wanted to do is bench is basically squat 400, bench 300, and deadlift 600. And that would be a 1,300 pound total, all raw. But uh, it's is that completely it's, raw, or is that with belt? It's actually with belt. But I actually just used a belt for the first time in five years. No, probably ten years. I haven't used a belt in about 10 years. Wow. And it does help me. So what's funny is I was my, – my best squat was 390 a couple months ago. But lately it's actually – I've been focusing on my deadlift. My squat went down a little. But then I put on the belt and I got 385 pretty easily. So I think I'm going to get the 400-pound squat. And I have the worst – I have a short torso and long femurs and short arms. I have very poor leverages for lift powerlifting. But uh, I'm going to get the squat, I'm pretty sure. I bench my bench is right around 295. I might get the the bench too. And ironically, I deadlifted 585 about uh, nine months ago. I thought the deadlift I'd get, and the deadlift I've gotten 565. I got it pretty easily. I probably had an extra 10 in me. Yeah. But I've tried 585 twice, and I couldn't get off the floor. So, what's realistic for me in three weeks? I don't know. I don't, I'm hoping for a miracle, like I just. I've never competed, so some people do better in competitions, the competitive flair, and and they thrive under that, and some people do more poorly. I think I'm the type that does worse. I don't like, I like my own setting and my own atmosphere, and I don't, you know, yeah. but we'll see. I don't know. If I don't get it, it's not the end of the world because I'll probably keep doing more meets over time. I have learned a ton. I've always trained with progressive overload on the big, big lifts, but it's different when you're trying to actually peak. You know, yeah, I think you'll have a. I, I mean, if you're anything like me, you'll have a carryover in your deadlift. For me, I uh, my squat was. I was feeling unconfident about my squat. I hit 405 a couple times in training, uh, one time for even a double. But leading up to the competition, like 385 was starting to kill me. I even missed at 405 a couple times. Uh, but come the meet day, I, I realized my brother was there because I usually train alone, and I was at, going well below parallel for the thing. Um, for what this, the competition accepted. And so all of a sudden, I, I get up to 365 in my warm-ups, and it was hard going what I thought was normal depth. And I'm like, oh, shit, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hit 385, let alone 405. And then he's like, dude, you're going well below parallel. And so I just did one quick warm-up rep at 135 just to feel depth. I'm like, holy shit, I felt like I was moving, doing a half squat. And so I go in there, hit 385, and then I got a five-pound PR at 410. Um, but And then the bench, that I've hit 305 in training, and I missed – 300 twice uh just about halfway up couldn't get going and then in the deadlift like i said if you're what in you saying so was that what'd you get in your meat the total was 1170 oh, what'd you, what'd you bench, bench? uh I, my first warm-up which was a 275 
And then you missed the 305? 300 twice. Yeah, I, missed, I took it twice and missed it. Um, and then the deadlift uh, said it went in thinking 465 because I hit 455 a couple weeks before. So I was thinking 460, 465 was going to be about it. Hit 465, went up easy. And so I went four, 485 for 30 pound extra and nailed it. But so I think you'll get it. If you're, and I especially, I mean, I love the deadlifts. And if you're anything like me, I think you'll get a good carryover. Well, and, and the other thing is it all depends what lifts you choose. So there's an art to that. It's like, do I, you know, like, what do I want to really be conservative with my first lift? And what do I want with my second lift? And then I know if I'm not the type that, like, I've got training partners who they get like revved up as the loads get heavier. I get fatigued. So if I want to deadlift 600 pounds and it's, you know, the last, and I'm also doing the curl, curl competition. So I do curls first, then bench, then, or sorry, then squats, then bench. And then it's like, you know, later on in the day, I'm tired out. And now I'm doing the deadlifts. Okay, do I do what? What do I do for my three lifts? Do I do a, you know, like a 500 pound opener, which is pretty easy? And then for my second lift, do I try 565? That's been hard for me in training. But if I get the 565 and it's a grinder, then I have no chance for the 600. So then I just probably try for 585. But but if I maybe just went right to the 600, maybe I could do it. I don't, it's like, no, I was, it all, I'll see when I get there and figure I, it out. What do you have, like for me, I think it kind of went along because my most anxiety was the deadlift. And I think it went, it went along. That's what it was, I was most anxious about the deadlift, worried about it, if you will. I'm like, you know, I don't get too uh, amped up in training sessions. Uh, but my, my, my squat, I was anxious about the bench. I wasn't too concerned with, but when it came to down the deadlift time in between um, bench and deadlift, there was a good two hour break and I was just feeling drained of energy. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pull 465. Um, but then once, once we in, were in the back and started warming up, I just, there was no anxiety at all. Cause I love the deadlift. I was just excited. Even even how fatigued I was, I was just excited to be doing the deadlift and training with all these other guys um, doing it, and I just took that energy into the lift. Um, so you might find that little second wind um, once it comes to that time. Oh, so so I need like a thirty pound boost somehow in my deadlift. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, try uh, some of that smelling salt or whatever the ammonia or whatever. I don't know. I've never done that. <laughs> did not that just something. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, wrap this thing up. Um, talk briefly about your book coming out on April 2nd, Strong Curves. You mentioned it at the beginning of uh, your book with Kelly Davis. Uh, what's it going to be about and who's it geared towards and anything else you want to add? Curves, it's, uh, yep, coming out April 2nd. It's available on Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble. It's, um, uh, we spent, God, Kelly and I spent, this thing's like two years in the making. We spent, first, we wrote an ebook, and then we were approached by a, uh, publisher I said, do you guys want to turn this into a, a, you know, a printed published book? We said, hell yeah. But it took so long because we wrote the book and then the, the, man, the publishers actually wanted a detailed exercise index. And that thing took an extra few months to write that exercise index and we took so many pictures and so that delayed the publication date. But now looking back, I'm so happy that I partnered with Kelly because I'm not the best writer, you know, I'm, I'm very scientific and mathematical, um, but I, she helped me, the wording is great, it flows well, she's such a, she's a good natural writer and she helped put the feminine touch on it and it, the, the publishers did a great job with the graphics design and everything like that and so the feedback so far has been, and we've had some people read it and they, they're thinking like, they're like, Brett, this is the best book I've ever read for, for women. It's I hope everyone feels that way because I've spent. This is my my magnum opus here. This is like the this is all my methods, and what I do to to get women looking their best. And I hope it's well received. So, yep, comes out April second. It's got like I don't know how many exercises are in there. Two three hundred exercises. There's twelve week programs for all stages for beginners for more advanced. There's lots of programs. I should know this. I should know how many there are. But Kelly would know that. She's keeps me in check. But um. Yep, the programs are very good. There's programs for people who have like minimal equipment versus you know advanced uh, protocols with more more you know well-rounded gyms that have more equipment and things like that. And we try to I try to say I want people using this stuff for they could train this way for life if they wanted to. So I concluded the basic beginner exercises all the way up to the most advanced. You know, not many people can do like weighted glute ham raises and things like that but, but I included it just because if you stick with this for years year in year out you will eventually get to that point 
I love what you just said there about making a lot of the programs out there are just like they're set up to be three or three month, twelve week, whatever programs. Um, and I feel like that's the shift a lot of, that we need to make in the industry is developing our programs that we're giving out to these people um, to be more of a lifestyle so that they can take with it and run from it, and not be jumping, to actually learn something and apply it to themselves, and now taking it upon as an not to pun the my website, but take it upon themselves as an art to their fitness so they can learn how to manipulate with themselves instead of being so confined to some 12 week program that they found in some ebook. Um, so with that all said, what do we have? I know you're speaking at the fitness summit in Kansas city uh, coming up in about six weeks now. Uh, I'll be there. What do I have to look forward to? I'm going to be talking about the, well, I'm actually doing two sessions. I'm doing a lecture on posterior chain. So I always talk about glutes, but I'm excited because I, I've, uh, my colleague Chris Beardsley and I have pulled up all the research on hamstrings and we, we've summarized it in our, a couple different products but there's so much good research on hamstrings, glutes and there's also a lot to think about with the erectors so I'm doing a lecture on the posterior chain so erectors, glutes and hamstrings and then I'm also doing a practical uh, which because there's so much um, uh, I love presenting the science of things but some of this stuff has to be learned hands-on in a practical environment, you know? Have people doing exercises and then point out to them, here's what, that's where the light bulbs go off. You know, when I do my, my all-day seminars, that's the real, you, you got to know the science, but then when you incorporate that science into the practical, then it's like, oh, okay, this is, it all makes sense. You've got light bulbs going off. What are, uh, one quick question before we go. What are, some, this is kind of just, kind of go, going back into the discussion for some reason, but uh, it just popped in my mind. What are some of the best exercises for strengthening the lower back when you're really trying to isolate it? I, I, some exercises like back extensions, back raises or something like that might target the glutes or hamstrings more. Are those, but those two will get a good um, reading as far as EMG is concerned. Um, yeah. with the, a lot of people think that, you know, they'll be like, oh, back extensions and reverse hypers for the back. Those exercises don't get, um, don't necessarily get, the EMG up is high. They don't always. They do sometimes, but um, it depends how you do them. So, like, and also you want to train the back. Like in in squatting and deadlifting, the back works mostly statically. You don't want all the range of motion coming from the spine. So you want to keep the spine in more neutralish positions. We talked about letting the upper back round, but you don't want the lower back to round in a deadlift or a squat. And so, do you get more? I mean, think about it. When you're doing a squat or a deadlift, the bar is either on your upper back or in your hands and you're bending over, you've got this long moment arm, this long lever arm, and with the load out far from the body, that is producing a ton of torque at the lumbar spine. When you do a, a back extension or a reverse hyper, it's kind of different. It's a different, the, the, the mechanics are different. So you're still loading the spinal erectors a lot. Um, some exercise, you know that squats actually activate the lumbar erectors more than deadlifts. I wouldn't have thought that. Oh. I think that's because of their anterior tilting. Um, at the bottom of a squat, you want to go and post your tilt. You've got to, you know, your hips are getting down in that range of motion. You've got to keep that turned on. But, um, but the thoracic extensors get activated more in the deadlift. There's a one journal article showing that. And so to me, you want if you want to bring up the erectors, if that's a weak link of yours, they're a good exercise. Like the seated good morning, that's that's an exercise that is good, but people do it wrong. And people do it very dangerously, but you shouldn't go that heavy on it. And you, you from a seated position, you can use like the safety squat bar and just kind of you're focusing on the upper back. There's also you can kind of round your back over a glute ham pad, not your low back, it's your upper back, and just do back extensions like you can use dumbbells, you can use this, the exercise you can do dynamically to try to bring those muscle groups up. And there's also ways you can do the classic lifts to emphasize more. It just depends. So there are lots of good exercises, but a lot of people for their goals don't need to do special exercise for the erectors, but some people should. Okay. Well, awesome. Depends. Awesome. Well, this was a fantastic interview, Brett. I want to appreciate uh, – thank you for coming on to the show. I appreciate it. Um, it was awesome. I know everyone's going to enjoy it. Um, any parting words you want to go with before we uh, sign off here? Um, websites, brettcondress.com, and you can – if you like what you heard, you can go to like YouTube. Uh, from my blog, you can find my YouTube channel, my Twitter, my Facebook, and all that stuff, and you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm always – cranking out stuff and pumping out newsletters every week so you can stay current with all my stuff. 
Awesome. And I'll be sure to put links below that, below the video and everything, so people can quickly access, access it, plus uh, links to the book, uh, Strong Curves, coming out April 2nd. So with that all said, everyone, I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Art of Physical Fitness Show with Brett Contreras of BrettContreras.com and StrengthAndConditioningResearch.com. Until next time, I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Goodbye.